Brother Woods, Brother Price, and men and brethren. My position is that the entire redemptive economy centers around the postulate that the Holy Spirit of God personally indwells baptized believers as a result of the remission of their sins. That a personal indwelling of the Holy Spirit blends perfectly with and is a demonstrated implementation of God's objectives as declared in the New Covenant. I have further established, and will not rehash this ground again for my brethren, that the Holy Spirit cannot be divorced from his person and that he is where he's declared to be, figuratively, bodily, however you want to add these additional words, they are not in the Scripture. And I refuse to honor and give dignity to interpretations and questions that are not posed by God. God says he dwells. I believe he dwells. I proclaim he dwells. As to being filled with the Spirit, being, quote, a single shock filling as these fellows believe, God knows, I know, and you should know that this is not the truth. I do not believe this. And uh, it is not to your advantage to identify me with other false modes of thought. You deal with what I said, not what other, what people said. The Lord of the church, Jesus Christ, is called in Scripture the last Adam and the second man. There is a particular point of emphasis and principle here that directly bears on this discussion that I want to establish. He is, his, he is the last Adam in that he is the last of the necessarily cursed. He is the second man as he is the progenitor of the people of God, that royal priesthood of 1 Peter 2.9. Now, while there is a whole body of teaching associated with him being the last Adam, such as he made an end of sin and finished transgression and bore their sins in his body on the tree and so forth, I wish to focus my attention on the second man. 1 Corinthians 15, 47. The second man is the Lord from heaven. This term second is not a chronological term, it's an argument for a new order of man, a new kind of man. To elaborate this definition, Jesus is said to appear in Scripture the second time, Hebrews 9, 28. Actually, it's not a second time chronologically. He appeared numerous times after his resurrection, as is itemized in 1 Corinthians 15, 5. He appeared first one time in the end of the world, and the second appearing shall be without sin unto salvation. That is a different kind of appearing. If you will bear with me a moment more, the new covenant is called the second. Hebrews, the eighth chapter, verse seven. It is a second covenant, not by chronological count, but because it is a different kind of covenant. It is not according to the covenant which I made with their fathers, a different type of covenant. We read of a second death in Revelation 2.11, which is a different kind of death, everlasting destruction from the glory of the Lord and the glory of his power. Now, Christ is a second man, a new order of man. This is a pivotal teaching in the gospel. He is not a second man in an isolated sense or Adam a first man in an isolated sense. They obtain their status as first Adam and second man in regards to their races, their respective races that followed them. This is this elaborated in detail in Romans the fifth chapter verses 15 through 19 where Adam stands for all of his progenitors, 
Christ stands for all of his progenitors. It is two different types of mankind. Our likeness to the Lord Jesus Christ or our kinship with him as the second man is identified by the term brethren. In Hebrews, the second chapter, and verse 17, this word. <clears throat> Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. It is asserted with divine pungency in Hebrews, the second chapter, and verse 11, that because he that sanctifieth, and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. That is to say, because God is his father, and God is our father, not biologically. God is not biological. God is a spirit. Man is a spirit. He's a living soul, not a biological entity. And God has begotten us with the word of truth that we might be the kind of first fruits of his creatures. As James, the first chapter, poignantly states. We ought to be called the sons of God. The scripture asserts this in 1 John 3, 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Why? Because we are the sons of God. We are brethren of Christ. Now follow this. Christ is our brother because he partook of the nature of the seed of Abraham. He took upon himself the robe of sinful, likeness of sinful flesh. He came in that likeness came as a man, and by virtue of his identification with us as a man, he's our brother. By virtue of our assimilation of his spirit, being joined to him in one spirit, by virtue of the spirit of Christ dwelling in us, we become his brother. Brethren of our Lord is an exact term. We are his brethren. We do have an earthly nature that's basically unreconciled, but more than that, we have received the spirit of adoption. The spirit of adoption cannot be received impersonally. He is a person. We are distinct from the world in the same sense Jesus was, not just because of what we do. As he is, John states in 1 John 4, 17, so are we in the world. We have in the people of God a divine merger of heaven and earth. We are categorically stated to be partakers of the divine nature. Just as Christ, in another sense, was partaker of the earthly nature. We are a blend of heaven and earth. There is a part of God in us as well as Adam. And we are the sons of God, offspring of the second man, because of this personal indwelling, as my opponent has choose to call it. If you deny the personal indwelling of the Spirit, it appears to me you are faced with the problem of denying the personal taking of the seed of Abraham. Was Jesus really a man or not? Was he not fully God and fully man with both natures remaining distinct? And am I not declared, and you as an obedient believer, to be a son of God? We are really sons of God. Not because we have done something, because we are something. God's people are not what they are because of what they do. It's because of what they are. They have been joined to the Lord. He is their brother, and they are his brethren. This is what experientially separates us from the Adamic order. It's the treasure in an earthen vessel, 2 Corinthians 4, 7. It's the bodies, our bodies, being temples of the Holy Ghost. 
Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren. Whatever sense, whatever sense he's the firstborn in, that's the sense you are the creation of God, according to James. You are not in the precise image of Christ, but you are being conformed to his image. Not by virtue of a moral reawakening, but by virtue of a spiritual conformity to the Lord Jesus Christ. Take that in dwelling away and no covenantal distinction exists. No substantiation of sonship or brethren. It is because ye are sons, Galatians 4, 6, that God has sent forth his spirit into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, the inmost citadel of your person, your heart. The scripture says God sent his spirit there because you're a son. And the presence of that spirit attests that you're a son. I call upon you to believe that. To receive what God has said about it. Either the word of God is the sword of the spirit or is it, it is not. Either I can take what God said and believe it or I cannot. I believe it. I exhort you to believe it. The indwelling is an extension of the second man. If it is not, Jesus has no generation. If he does not have an offspring like him, then the lament of Isaiah is true. He said in Isaiah 53, 8, Who shall declare his generation? He was cut off out of the land of the living. He had no earthly progeny, no offspring according to the flesh, but his offspring are innumerous. They are as numerous as the sands of the sea. There's an innumerable company that's going to be redeemed out of every kindred and tribe and tongue and nation and people that are his generation. It's being declared in the gospel. We are the sons of God. The spirit in us attests that. How can you confirm you're a son without it? Hereby we know that we dwell in him and he in us by the spirit which he hath given us. The likeness is spiritual, not external, not a mere change of habit. Spiritual refers to joining our spirit with the Lord. That, that text does offer a great deal of trouble, doesn't it? He that's joined to the Lord is one, one spirit. Now an argument is founded on that, as our brother states. Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two saith he shall be one flesh. That's the truth. Are you going to explain it away all you want? It says that husband and wife shall become one flesh. Either they are or they aren't. Now you can conceive what you think one flesh means, but they're one flesh. That's what he said. He said of us with Jesus, using that precise terminology, we are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. They were brought together. We are one spirit. We're, the joining is the emphasis. Not the means, the joining we have been joined to the Lord. I affirm that. And the Holy Spirit bears witness to it also, to your spirit. Or can man, utilizing his natural resources, accomplish spirituality without being joined to the Lord? Or is joining to the Lord another one of those figurative or metaphorical things? Has redemption really wrought something or has it not? In the gospel, have people been reconciled to God and can they draw near to God? And does water flow out of their belly? Does out of them come the Holy Spirit as John interprets in 1 John 7, 39 or does it not? This is the reason for the appellation that Jesus is the beginning of the creation of God. Revelation 3, 14. Because he has a whole generation, bless God, of sons that are like his son. In measure, each one partaking in measure of the Spirit of Christ. He is the first of a new and distinct order, an order which my opponent repudiates by asserting that the Holy Spirit does not actually bodily, literally, or in his own person dwell on the individual question, uh, Christian. Now, brethren, the question is not, does the Spirit dwell in us bodily? That's not the question posed in Scripture, and you will pardon me if I say that that's an improper question. The question is, does he or does he not? That's the question. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ,
Christ, he's not of his. The question isn't how he dwells, it's if he dwells. If he's in you or not. If he's not, you're not a son. If he is, you are. Now I insist that you can work that out with fear and trembling before the Lord without theological modifications. We need to elaborate more here that man's spirit and God's spirit are compatible. Man is made in the image of God. In his likeness created he him. That image still remains. He is the ex, he is the image of God's person. 1 Corinthians 11, 7 founds an argument on that, as well as Genesis, the ninth chapter, verse 6, where capital punishment uh, was instigated because man was made in the image of God, and whoso sheddeth man's blood uh, was to be killed. That image is inherent, has an inherent capacity to be joined to the Lord. Man is unique. He is not like a, any other creation. The concept of an image includes not only likeness, but capacity. That is, man not only bears a likeness to God in his powers of reason and in his powers of analysis, so to speak, but he has a capacity to fellowship with and be joined to the living God. Unlike angels, God made man to be sons and daughters, and they are, as you know, begotten. Can this be realized without an effectual union with God is inconceivable to me. You know, even the Pharisees and scribes, when they heard Jesus say he was the Son of God, knew that the term Son of God bore with it an inherent intimacy with God. They said he said he was a Son of God, making himself equal with God. Now, I'm not making you equal with God or myself equal with God. We bear God's image in measure. But I'm telling you this, the term Son of God means a whole lot more than you've been led to believe. It's a large term and a large concept, and an enormous work of redemption lies behind it. And it has been implemented by the Holy Spirit of God being placed upon your spirit. Sonship is the absolute mark of the covenant, and sonship cannot be attested without the possession of the Holy Spirit of God. We are dealing here with the certitude of the Spirit's presence and work continually being asserted in us. There is a unique requirement in the kingdom of God for Christ to dwell in our hearts by faith. Ephesians 3.16 says that the Holy Spirit strengthens us with might by his power in the inner man that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith. <clears throat> now my question is, is this a unique requirement of the apostolic age that Christ dwell in our hearts? Or did he mean that something other than Christ dwelled in our heart? Or am I at liberty to believe what this says? That Christ, Christ, brethren, is a person. Somehow this is being missed in this debate, that we are talking about persons, not theological concepts. I am in Marlowe, I am here, and Christ is in his people, and God is in his people, and the Spirit is in his people. Either they are or they aren't. He said they were. We believe it. This is not a destruction of man's capacities, but an empowerment of them that enables him to comprehend things that only God otherwise comprehends, which does not deal with new truths, but the depth of the truth, and the height of the truth, and the breadth of the truth. One final word. <clears throat> is the written word of God more powerful than the incarnate word of God. Jesus Christ said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John 6, 63. It's inconceivable that any other words could have more power than the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. When he spoke them to his disciples, some of the simplest of saints, of saints were undiscerned by them. <coughs> Now that the Holy Spirit has been given, those are the words of the apostle, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because it got, Christ was not yet glorified. Now that he has been given, those sayings are discerned 
because the spirit from within working in concert with your spirit has given understanding of the gospel that passes knowledge. 